So my name is Richard Gunther, and we're going to have a panel today talking about IoT-powered kitchen commerce. The company has been working to bring commerce into our kitchens for a while now. And last year, on the stage in last year's venue, I spoke with a couple of companies that were pioneering that space. So things are changing constantly and evolving. And today, we're going to talk with two people who are deep in this space. And I'm going to ask each of them to kind of introduce themselves. But we have Nick Holzer from Samsung Next and Tom Cooper from Pantry. And I'll ask you to kind of introduce your backgrounds and how people might know of your brands. And let's start with you, Nick. Great. Hi. Uh, Nick, founder of Whisk, founded the company in 2012. Um, we power, well, we, have, we are a smart food platform, a food AI that powers lots of experiences for lots of different companies in the space. But in particular, in the commerce space, we power shopping tools that sit across some of the biggest recipe sites in the world, people like BBC Good Food, All Recipes, um, uh, some of the Food Network properties. So large-scale large, large scale publishers, grocery companies, uh, IoT companies, and TPG brands, we power commerce tools on those platforms, um, which means you can go from a recipe site, click buy, matches all the right products from the retailer, and then fills the retail basket to complete it. Um, in the last few years, we've been doing that for Samsung and a whole bunch of other um, people in the IoT space, other manufacturers and kitchen manufacturers as well, where you're essentially also able to go from a shopping list or a recipe straight to commerce. Um, and yeah, six months ago, our company was acquired by Samsung. Um, so I'm now part of a now scaling whisk at Samsung, um, but also uh, taking a slightly broader view in terms of how, how what, what does the Samsung food experience look like. Hi all, I'm Tom from Pantry. I'm the CEO. Um, Pantry, you've probably not heard of us just yet. So we've built a piece of middleware that sits in between kitchen appliances and retailers. And so what we like to say is we built the first e-commerce platform designed purely for machines to shop at. What that looks like for kitchen appliance industry is a set of APIs that they can easily interact with and send data through to us, and then we can turn them into e-commerce transactions. For the user, it looks like a, an interface of some form, be that in our own app experience or in a third-party application made by the manufacturer, that they configure that appliance to shop automatically for its consumables. All right, cool. So, so that we're all on the same page here, Nick, how, how are we defining kitchen commerce? When, if someone asks you, you say, oh, we're in kitchen commerce, well, what does that mean? Um, so I think it's uh, the way that most of the large appliance manufacturers talk about it or think about it. It's you're on your uh, kitchen appliance, and you're able, you allow the user to easily buy the things they need, whether that is um, replacement dishwasher tablets or you know, coffee machine capsules, or whether that's all the ingredients you need from a recipe. And it basically, uh, it usually means connecting with the existing places that someone goes to buy their stuff, whether that is a grocery retailer, um, e-commerce, or in-store. You good with that? Yeah, yeah, I'd second that. Yeah. All right, yeah. all right. So uh, I'm going to ask each of you, you gave a little bit of background about what your companies do, but let's kind of dive in there. What do each of your respective platforms um, kind of do? What are your touch points? Who are your typical customers? Uh, I, what, I, what I want people to get a feel for is kind of how different your respective offerings are, even though they're in the same space. And Tom, let's start with you for this one. Yeah, sure. So we've looked at the idea, sort of this Jetsons future. So I want that. If we, if we stick our future goggles on and we look forward to the year 2030, 2040, 2050, the idea is that in theory, our machines can start shopping for us. And this is the big promise of the smart kitchen, right? That all of a sudden, the kitchen can do the shop, it can do the cooking, etc. But we've looked at what we've got today, and we've looked at, well, what can the appliances do today? And actually, they can do a lot less. So we focus specifically on what an appliance can do today 
to do that automated e-commerce transaction. And so we've built up a list of three appliances, dishwashers, washing machines, and coffee. And we said, let's concentrate on these, and let's make these shop automatically really, really well. And then as the world scales out, as the appliance manufacturers figure out how to make kitchen appliances shop better and understand what's being consumed better across the board with the other appliances, then we can onboard those when they're ready. Things like fridges, cookers, potentially these items where we need maybe a string of three or four different appliances explaining little bits about the consumption history. That's the story for 10 years' time. So today, as I say, we're just concentrating on those things that will work and work today. OK. And Nick? Um, our focus is more making recipes and whole shopping lists um, shoppable. So it's if you go to one of the big recipe sites and you click add to a shopping list, that's probably a whisk powered functionality. Um, we have it live on about half a billion monthly um, interactions across the web um, and across apps. So and the way that we make it shoppable is we don't have any stock. We don't, we're not a retailer ourselves and never will be. We basically connect you to your existing retailer. So we connect um, large recipe sites to large retailers. Like, so for example, a food network to a Walmart or to a Kroger or to any of the other big retailers. Um, and in that process, um, the challenge we're solving is if you have you know, 20, 30 items you need in a shopping list or in a recipe, is how do you find the right product at the retailer that you would have, used, would have chosen yourself anyway without having to make you go through this process of trying to find every single item? So we use a lot of machine learning to basically understand what is the context the user's in, so what are they planning to buy, and what products are available at the retailer and where that user's located, and then match the right products um, for the user and learn um, as the user shops more and more and more through the platform. Um, that is live on Samsung. So if you go across any of the Samsung uh, smart fridges and some of the other applications, you'll see it there. And um, it's also live today on a whole bunch of the other big appliance manufacturers that are here today. So you're not actually producing content or conducting commerce so much as facilitating those relationships and interfaces. Exactly. It's not about being a publisher. We think there's enough, there's many, many fantastic ones out there. Uh, it's not about being a retailer. It's about doing all the connections in between. And that's the real problem that we think, uh, one of the big problems that exists in this space. Um, it's also through something we call the open food platform. Um, when you add, when you start a shopping list on one device, and you move to the next device, and the same shopping list persists, so you can add to it. So for example, you can go um, on your phone and add something, add a recipe to your shopping list. You can then go to your kitchen and tell your voice assistant you want to add another couple of items, then go to your smart fridge. And it's one shopping list that kind of carries all the way through, um, which means that from a user perspective, you don't want to be able to, you don't want these one-to-one -one connections. You want like one-to-many. Um, and exactly that dynamic has been super important in how our business has grown. So what happened was, you know, we, when we first started out, we were a small, uh, we, had, we had one small publisher, I think with maybe a million impressions a month or something like that. Um, and we spoke to the big retailers, and we're like, we've got a million impressions, surely you want us to connect it through to you? And they were like, we're not interested. Um, and actually what we found is only when we get to kind of scale of 50, 100, 200 million monthly, you know, uh, interactions on these different partners we integrate, only then will the big retailers, you know, do they become interested in connecting into our platform? So it's very much a marketplace uh, kind of dynamic um, where you know, if you're one publisher trying to work with a retailer, you'll probably fail because you haven't got enough scale. We basically take all of these different publishers and all these different devices and you know, kitchen appliances together um, into one marketplace and then connect all the retailers into it. So all the connectivity bit is kind of the problem we're solving in that space. Okay, now, Tom, when you were describing your business, it, it sounds a whole lot like a replenishment program that some local company also offers. <laughs> yeah, Amazon Dash, yes. So, so, so <laughs> why, why are you building your own? Um, several reasons. So first, the world is entirely made of Amazon, although they're, I suppose, trying to do that in a certain sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we provide an alternate choice. and. Although the consumer clearly um, likes what Amazon do, um, they also want the choice to go and shop with other vendors. So we've concentrated on the verticals that we're operating in, particularly in things like coffee, in working with local artisanal roasters. Now that's a group of people who wouldn't necessarily want to go on a platform like Amazon. 
So we can add different choice there. From the industry point of view, looking at the kitchen appliance manufacturers, they've also got an issue with Amazon. Number one, Amazon has got a history of coming into a market and slaying the incumbents. <laughs> Is anyone here from Amazon, incidentally? <laughs> no? Nobody's okay. going to raise <laughs> no, their hand. Come on. <laughs> and so there's a bit of nervousness around the industry about currently Dash being the only show in town. So we're able to provide the alternative platform for the appliance manufacturers to come along and try out this auto replenishment piece. Mm -hmm. And on top of that then, when the appliance manufacturers have Amazon Dash implemented, they then got an issue actually getting that into the stores. So the appliance industry has got a huge opportunity to build recurring revenue here. And part of that is they need to promote it to the consumer and tell that consumer story. At the moment, you've got a retail industry that sells these appliances that are really not happy about the idea of promoting their competition as well. So what we can provide is a slightly less known alternative um, to do principally the same job, I guess. But um, yeah, sort of not everybody wants to buy a Ford. Some people like to buy a Chevy or a BMW. No, that's maybe. a very so, good point. Yeah, so, so what does a market with pantry-enabled devices look like at a big box store? Are, are you literally looking at one manufacturer's appliance next to another's where they might say, you know, powered by Amazon Dash and the other one might say powered by pantry? Yeah, ideally. I mean, that's obviously the, the big picture stuff. Yeah, we, you go into Best Buy and you walk in, you've got the Google Home, you've got the Nest stand, you've got the Fitbit. Um, I think with what we're doing, there's a big opportunity in five years' time as this scales out. From a user point of view, there's something that's really simple, um, a really simple value proposition is the fact that now you can start handing over the appliance to do this automatic shopping for you. And so that's something that a user can really easily cling on to. And our value proposition to the appliance manufacturers is, is that. So to have that in some form of POS in the likes of a Best Buy, with maybe Pantry, maybe Amazon Dash, maybe whoever else pops up in the future, I think that's something that the appliance industry can use as a whole to really push forward sales and get off this sort of eight, 10 year sort of replacement cycle, particularly in the smaller homewares um, environment where maybe swapping out a coffee machine on, on the work surface is a lot easier than taking out an installed piece of kit in the kitchen. I think what's really interesting with Pantry's offering as well is that consumers uh, more and more do want these artisanal brands and kind of niche smaller companies, um, which they, it gives them a better experience or they feel like it gives them a better experience. Right. And they feel more connected to those brands. Uh, and making those available um, in, in, a, in an Amazon Dash-like you know, kind of way, um, I think is a, is, a, is a pretty compelling proposition especially if you're a large appliance manufacturer which doesn't want to have the Amazon Dash um, integration. I think when we were speaking a few months ago, you were telling me that, um, that, that actually a lot of these retailers which stock the, digit, the, the appliances don't want to have Amazon written on there because yeah, Amazon's well, directly competing yeah. at the point of purchase, right? Yeah, more so. They'll, they'll actually, they've actually said to quite a few different manufacturers, if you try and promote anything as Amazon, we'll just delist the products. And so, yeah, there's a big industry issue there um, with, with Amazon. So, yeah, that, that's something I guess that we're hoping to use to our advantage as a, as a small startup and um, compete against this big um, behemoth of a company. So, yeah. And Tom and Goliath. It's, <laughs> it's also fascinating, actually, on, the, on our, uh, the rest of the industry. So, we, we, oh, a question that ha comes up relatively frequently from our customers, our retail customers. We power some of the biggest retailers in the UK, US, and Europe, and, and some in Asia. Uh, um, that they actually ask us, who are you hosted by? And we're like, well, well you know, this is our list of hosting providers that we use. And they, what they're looking for is, are you hosted on AWS? Uh, and it's, you could, you know, most of us would think that's totally unrelated. You know, are you using AWS to host your service? But that's how uh, scared some of the players are of Amazon. <laughs> 
and actually the, the impact it has and because I guess it's anti-Amazon feeling hmm. um, within the food industry. Um, obviously, we're also, Amazon's a, a big partner of ours and we, we, we have a good partnership with them. So you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very pro-Amazon. Um, but but, but uh, just right. kind of the industry, kind of what happens when you're in these conversations with some of the big retailers and some of the you know, digital um, appliance manufacturers, it's fascinating, I think. Yeah, yeah we, we, can, we can help the, the rest of the industry compete on a more level playing field. Because I mean, let's face it, Amazon do a very good job. So um, in some ways, we're facilitating everyone else to compete at the same level where um, national players and smaller um, players in, inside of a nation can't necessarily compete without services like what we're doing. Yeah, that makes sense. So Nick, it, when you're talking about the service that you provide, I know there are other companies out there that are looking to solve the end-to-end -end problem. I don't know that they're offering the same thing, but you know, companies like uh, Sheffling and Init and others kind of come to mind. How, what is the competitive landscape for you? Yeah, what we, what we power is very broad, so it really comes down to, um, you know, it, it, and, it, and then the background to that is, um, uh, A, most of the building blocks you need to build pretty much any food experience is usually pretty similar. Um, and so you know, we have a set of APIs that people basically can build anything they want on top of. But if you look at, and in every single kind of deep vertical you go into, there are competitors, obviously. Um, in the kitchen space, especially when it comes to cooking, in it, I think are doing a fantastic and an amazing job with the UX. Their proposition is different to ours. Um, it's more of a you know, one-stop kind of integrated solution, whereas we're more of an API solution um, to allow people to build their own on top of it. Um, but, but, but absolutely, there is a, you know, um, an appliance manufacturer may choose one of us over the other. Um, in the commerce space, there's a different set of competitors. So um, in Germany, we had a competitor called Avocando. Um, we acquired them um, about a year ago. Um, I actually feel a bit sorry for the founder because he, he had to go through one integration with us, and then about six months later, he had to go into another integration with Samsung. Um, but, uh, but here in the US, there's two companies that are doing relatively well, doing interesting things. And Basketful is one of them, and Chicory is the other. Um, and I think there's probably some other sort of startups uh, probably popping up. There's always another one um, uh, every like a few months. Um, but we're the biggest, and I think the value, uh, or the, I guess the competitive advantage we have there is it is a marketplace. A retailer doesn't want to connect with one recipe site or even 10 recipe sites. If you can bring to them you know, half a billion monthly impressions or uh, interactions, that, that drives, that's when it becomes interesting. And that was also one of part of our logic for selling to Samsung. So the Samsung brought us you know, a whole bunch of great talent in terms of their, they've got a, a very talented team in San Francisco with, with product thinking. Um, uh, they also brought a whole bunch of investment into our team. We've gone from 30 people when we joined them six months ago to now over 100 working on the WISP platform. But actually most importantly, or not most, or, or part of, very importantly I should say rather than most, is their hardware footprint. So they have screens in almost every home in, the, in, 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 in most of the countries. Um, which means that now not only are we leveraging all the publishers and you know the IoT companies that we've integrated, but we're also leveraging Samsung. And this marketplace that we bring to a retailer can actually drive a good number of baskets back to that retailer. And that's when you get real engagement from the retailers. Because if you go to someone like Walmart and say, "Hey, I'm going to send you, you know, 5,000 shopping bit, shopping lists a month," um, they'll laugh at you and say, well, "Not laugh at you, but they'll say, sure, let's talk again uh, in, in two, three years' time when you've got more." Um, they, they, they have so many um, high priority items on their list. Often it's actually about just digitalizing their existing systems. Um, it's usually the number one priority. Um, that, that, that unless you bring real scale to these large reta uh, grocery retailers, you don't have much uh, chance of, of getting an integration. Yeah, and, uh, sorry. Uh, I think that touches on an interesting issue actually for the whole industry is that, um, so we're at arguably the primary kitchen, smart kitchen event across the globe. Um, could I see a show of hands? Who's from a retailer? One. Okay. Could you put your hand down if you're from Amazon? Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I think, that, I think that sums it up. Um, the retail industry isn't interested at the moment in building this world out. And so I think as a from an appliance industry perspective, we need to look at alternate solutions about how we actually deal with that and get those APIs 
available and get, get all of that flow through so that we can start to build the users up to a point where we can then, like Nick says, as an industry, have more of those conversations uh, with, with a bulk of users behind us and have that power to then sort of actually properly get in so that a user can then go across to one of these appliances, expect to be able to shop, and have those API endpoints, that, well, in that case, have their local shop that they want to use available so they can shop with the people they want to, not just with the few people that have popped up that are available. And also, the second element to that as well is the money side. So the whole industry has got the ability here to build recurring revenue because we're all of a sudden producing a sale. And so one thing that we've been very focused on is looking at okay, well, we could potentially go and build a load of users, but can those users also pay? And so the one thing that we've been very keen to do with Pantry is only sign up retailers where we can make margin, so we can then pass that margin on to the appliance manufacturers, so that then the appliance manufacturers have got more reason to actually build out this e-commerce element as well, because there's a compelling business model for them to do so. That's something that I think is a secondary. Once the users have been built and once the user can be sent over to the individual retailers, how do then you get a degree of margin off the retailers so that you can make the whole thing worthwhile from a business point of view for the appliance industry? So the, the retailers aren't the only, I don't want to call them the problem, but they're not the only big challenge because not only are they kind of being thrown into technology that they don't necessarily understand and probably never had interest in getting involved in, but they need to now to stay competitive, but on the manufacturer side, the product side, those are also large companies that typically move slowly and have a hard time adapting to quick changes in technology like what you're offering, Tom. Yeah. So one of the things I'd be curious about is just exploring this dichotomy, if you will, of startups trying to work with larger companies and helping them be more nimble despite <coughs> themselves? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I think, yeah, so you've got two, in, with, re, with the um, grocery retail and with the appliance industry, you have got two very, very slow-moving industries with big behemoth players. If you look at the appliance industry, um, for, for instance, in some ways that's a good thing because what that actually means is that means that you're getting products that are high quality, that are going to last for a long time. And that's something that the appliance industry needs to deliver. Now that all of a sudden the smart kitchens come along and you've got to bring in all this innovation and you've got to bring all this new fancy toys in, that's something that inherently jars with the idea that you take your time, you test things properly, you've got these five-year um, device cycles where you can really think about things properly. I think looking at um, Joe's, Joe's comments um, from Wired, which I think is almost a bellwether sort of um, line in the sand that almost sort of shuts off the first generation of the smart kitchen. What we've seen is we've seen the appliance industry trying to lead that innovation and the startups coming and sort of just doing a bit of painting around the edges. I think for the next phase, as we go into sort of this next five year cycle, I think what needs to now happen is more that the, um, the startups lead the way and I see, I see it's coming with a lot of the appliance manufacturers now. They're sort of being a lot more open in the view that as long as they keep their distance and they concentrate on making decent appliances, they can facilitate these apps and these services that sit above that can go and mess up. Because let's face it, startups are all about messing up five times and getting it right the sixth time, and then it works. Now, that's a far better way to do things for the appliance industry because at, Underneath that, you can have the appliance that works every single time. Some startups will work and they'll scale. Other startups won't and they'll fail. But if we let the startups run, they can quickly innovate, quickly try out new things, run on three month dev times rather than five year dev times and just keep on iterating until maybe in five years time we do the same amount of innovation that would have on old times taken say 25, 30 years yeah, but 
I think the challenge you've got is that um, these large companies have so much budget, and they, yes, they've been very, very slow to get there, um, and they are, you know, at board level, um, they're not as digital as they could be. But um, what you're seeing, I think, now is startups have proven what works or doesn't work um, to some extent. And I think what you'll see is some of these really large retailers and CPG brands are, are hiring some really smart talent. And especially at the top retailers, the apps that are now being delivered are actually finally pretty good. Um, if someone hasn't checked out the, the Target app, for example, um, the Target app, the mobile app, has got really high ratings on the store. And actually, I think it does a great job of helping you find products when you're in store and helping you find more information about products. And so I think these large retailers are catching up. They are learning what worked and didn't work from the startups. And the challenge that startups have is we don't have very much cash. And I'm seeing this you know, firsthand at Samsung, where we went from, you know, we, we, we went very slowly up to 30 people. And then in six months, we're now over 100. And it's like they have money, right? So they can afford to invest in this stuff. So I, I obviously am a huge fan of start, startup innovation and things, but I, I do think um, the amount of money that these large companies do have to invest, and what you're starting to see, at, what you're starting to see from these you know, the, the announcements of people like Walmart and Kroger and Elvis and Safeway and similar retailers around the world um, about their investment and their, their strategy around putting more money into digital, I think what we're going to see is actually a lot of them catching up um, pretty quickly, and, and, start, and hopefully building some good propositions for users. Well, and presumably, stuff like that is facilitated by acquisitions like yours by Samsung and being a part of their, you know, Next is kind of like a labs program, if you will, for 100%. Samsung, right? And if you look at who's here from the large digital appliance manufacturers, um, for the most part, they are, it's, the, it's the M&A teams. They might not call themselves the M&A teams, but it's actually the M&A teams are, are, are here at SKS, right? So they're, they're not, yes, there are some partnership people here, um, and yes, they're also looking for partnerships. The M&A team are often involved in partnerships, but actually they're also very much here to th th figure out who are we gonna buy so that they can do it themselves. <laughs> that may end up being the perfect closing note because we're <laughs> running out of time and we don't have a timekeeper today, but uh, so I'll stand in and thank our panelists today for the discussion. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.